Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third evening of our Lenten mission. Uh, we anticipated that we might have a little lighter crowd, of course, because of St. Patrick's Day. So, uh, But <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Uh, this is always the day when I find it interesting that there are more Irish people among us than there were yesterday. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so we will uh, follow the same format this evening as we had on Tuesday night. Uh, we'll start with a brief uh, evening prayer, and then um, I'll come back up and introduce our speaker and then turn it over to her, and she'll lead us through the evening. And then at the end, uh, we'll take some time for questions uh, if you happen to have any. So uh, at this time, I'll go ahead and invite Deacon HV to come forward, and we'll go ahead and begin with our evening prayer. Please stand. As we come together this evening, asking for the Lord's guidance and assistance, let us begin as we begin on things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. And your spirit. to come, for shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Before the hills in order stood, our earth received her frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless is the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone. Short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Please be seated. my light and my salvation whom should i fear the lord is my stronghold and my refuge how can i be afraid the lord is my light and my salvation whom should i fear the lord is my stronghold and my refuge how can I be afraid? There is one thing I ask To live with you, Lord All of my days And all of my life The Lord is my light and my salvation whom should I fear? The Lord is my stronghold and my refuge. How can I be afraid? And he keeps me secure in times of great fear. He shelters my soul and lifts me high. Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my stronghold and my refuge. How can I be afraid? I believe that I shall see the goodness of my God in the land of the living, in the land of the living. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The 
Lord is my stronghold and my refuge. How can I be afraid? reading from the prophet Isaiah. Yet, just as from the heavens, the rain and snow come down and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall do what pleases me Achieving the end for which I send it. Yes, in joy you shall go forth. In peace you shall be brought home. Mountains and hills shall break out in song before you. On trees of the field shall clap their hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. O oh Lord, it is you who are my portion and cup. It is you yourself who are my prize. I keep the Lord ever in my sight, since he is at my right hand, I shall stand firm. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. And so my heart rejoice, as my soul is glad, even my body shall rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor let your beloved no decay. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. You will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence. At your right hand, at your right hand, happiness forever. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. Please stand. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds each joy in God the living God. So we praise your mighty deeds. My spirit sings the greatness of your name. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds its joy in God the living God. Our mercy flows throughout the land, and every generation knows your love. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds its joy in God the living God. We cast the mighty from their thrones and raise the poor and lowly to new life. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds its joy in God, the living God. We fill the hungry with good things. With empty hands you send the rich away. My soul rejoices. 
rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds its joy in God the living God. Just as you promised Abraham, you come to free your people Israel. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit finds its joy in God the living God. With confidence in God's love for us, we offer our petition that we will continue to reform our lives through this land. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our talk this evening by Allison will give us the strength to carry the crosses God blesses our lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That we will show compassion towards others as God shows to us. And for the people of Ukraine, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died will know the mercy of God. We pray to the we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us offer the prayer Christ himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on us as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God of love, bring us back to you. Send your spirit to make us strong in faith. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may unto me... Ah, and may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Uh, so this evening, um, I... I think we're all supposed to have a small little piece of paper. Does everybody have a square piece of paper? This is Allison's, but everybody, uh, she will tell us what this is for a little later, but just want to make sure that all of you uh, have that. Um, she told me what it was about, and I said, well, that sounds interesting. So, you know, looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> so Allison Delaney is here with us this evening. Um, as I mentioned uh, after Mass, uh, Allison worked at the Hospice House in Williamsburg for a number of years. Um, but recently she has been working at VCU uh, and she was there throughout much of the pandemic. Uh, and she has done quite a bit in the area of pastoral care uh, in hospital settings, but she also now has a unique uh, role, which I'm going to let her get into and talk about uh, quite a bit because I can't even explain it, but she definitely can. Um, she has such a wonderful, warm personality and just such a wonderful presence about her. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that she can uh, be here with us. Uh, her husband, Steve, uh, I introduced uh, many of you to if you were here for the synod process. Steve Delaney was the gentleman that was helping to lead us through that synod process. Uh, so his wife, Allison, uh, is who is here with us uh, today. So I know Allison's going to talk a little bit more um, about her family as well. But Allison just, again, has one of those personalities that is perfect for pastoral care, in my opinion, especially as a priest. Uh, and in fact, I can say that if I were someone that were ill and in the hospital or even dying, Allison and her personality is the type of person that I would want in the room with me. Uh, she's just has such a great pastoral sense about her. And so I'm thrilled that she's here this evening to talk with us about adversity in our third evening um, of our Lenten mission. And so uh, without further ado, uh, Allison Delaney. I'm also a little short. Thank you, Father Prince, for that warm welcome. Um, what he didn't say was what a light 
Um, he has been to our family, the Delaney family. Can you hear me all right? Okay. So uh, as he said, Steve worked with him for a number of years in the parish as a youth minister. Um, with all six foot of him, I think that's, you're even taller than that. He knelt down on his knees to give my son Ben his first communion. He trusted my eldest son, who's now 16, with the incensor through an entire Easter vigil. You can imagine that. He didn't burn anything down. And, uh, and he was there three years ago, and we and, um, said goodbye to my sister-in-law, Tessie, and was there at the graveside to help us say goodbye to her and, and welcome my nephew into our family. So um, been through with us through a lot of um, big parts of our lives. So thank you for that. And what a, a light he is to you all now here at this parish. I'm sure you're discovering that. So thanks, Father Prince, for giving me such an easy topic for reflection. <laughs> you should do it better than your husband. <laughs> Wasn't the first one about gratitude and praise, yes. forgiveness, tougher, but adversity? Why me? So looked up in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. A state, adversity is a state or instance of serious or continued difficulty or misfortune. That explains our life in the last three years. Um, my husband, Steve, is usually the one speaking in the church setting, and I'm usually the one speaking in the healthcare setting. Um, so the joke is in my house is that Father Prince thought of adversity and how well qualified I am because I've been married to Steve for almost 19 years. <laughs> um, I promise this whole, e whole evening will not be about our marriage. My hope is that this can be our sacred time our sacred time for reflecting on the shapes and sizes of adversity that we face. For being a little bit easier on ourselves and on each other, um, and for letting God have more room to act in our lives. So a little bit about me. If you hadn't seen my picture, um, no one expects Alison Delaney when they see me. <laughs> With the Irish last name, um, it just doesn't seem to fit the bill. Um, so I was Allison Chin before I got married. I'm a native Floridian, if you can believe that. Um, I love, those are palm trees right there, and um, sunny weather. Um, at holidays, my family would eat Jamaican patties, because we're Jamaican Chinese, and um, eat dim sum for a treat. Um, my parents were, I'm a cradle Catholic, my parents uh, grew up in Catholic school in Jamaica. There were a lot of missionary schools. Um, and so even though I went to public school, um, the Catholic tradition was very much a part of my upbringing. I've always been interested in health and healing, probably because my mom was a nurse um, and she would come home with stories and I was just so touched by um, how she could be there in the hour of need for people. Um, but I never liked needles. So I wasn't going to nursing school, no way, Jose. And I became a physical therapist. And I loved that work. I loved being part of that journey of healing. Um, and not everybody could be fully healed, but I loved helping them work through the pain and um, to get to walking or being more independent, whatever mattered to them. Um, but I found myself talking to people more than wanting to push them to do another knee lift or um, being seen as the pain and torturer, PT. Um, I was, became curious about that connection between the body and the mind and the spirit. And so I listened, and sometimes I found that that's what people needed more than anything else. Um, I remember a Vietnam vet, and he had had an amputation, and he couldn't walk, and he had lost all the things that gave him identity. Um, and he wouldn't do any exercises, so we just sat there for an hour, and everybody was frustrated with him. And I thought, you know, I think he just needs to be heard. And so I sat and listened to him and he said, you know, um, this is worse than anything I've experienced. And even Vietnam, right? How, how awful is this that I can't walk and take care of myself? Um, so, but after that, I was like, I'm not gonna force you to exercise. It's only what you wanna do. So what's important to you? And he told me, and after that moment, it was like a breakthrough. Like then he was willing to go through the pain and stretching and doing all the things he needed to get ready for the prosthesis. But it was getting in touch with that meaning, the why, that really mattered. Um, 
So as Father Prince said, I worked for eight years um, at the hospice house. And some would think, what a crazy job for a young person to do. <laughs> um, that uh, not that depressing? Isn't that like, why would you want to do that all the time? But I found it was such a privilege because people, um, all of us perhaps, um, have much less uh, guardedness, less masks on um, when we're at critical points in our life. So I felt like it gave me instant access to real people and to learn not about dying, but about how to live despite the fact that one day you're going to die. And so I just feel so privileged. And I'll share um, one particular story a little bit later because um, I feel like it's a gift, been a gift to me and helping me live my life the way I want to and hopefully a gift to you too. So I shifted, I can't explain my whole job just yet because it's pretty new in the last three, three months. Um, but basically um, I do spiritual care research. So who knew anybody did that? Um, but the point is to take what happens here like in a parish setting where you help nurture one another. And we have what I would call spiritual health. We talk about body health, we talk about emotional health, but there's this invisible thing called spiritual health, right? where um, it's hard to put our finger on it, but it's the meaning and the hope and our connection to God and to each other um, that we get through adversity. And so my job is to try to translate that for people who don't have the experience that you and I have of being in community, um, but they work in healthcare and they kind of divide out people like you're this disease, you're the knee, you're the stroke in that room. And then to remember that we're all human beings, right? Um, and that it matters that we listen to each other and how healing that is in itself. And this is my family. So see you in our makeshift garden. Um, I don't know if you can see this, it's kind of little, but Joseph holding our COVID puppy. Yes, we were one of those families. Um, ben is in the middle. Um, he's my artist, he's 13. And then Caden, he's my theater kid, my nephew. So tonight, I invite you to sit back and relax. Don't get stressed by the fact that you have a pen and paper in your lap. Um, let your head and your heart talk to one another, um, if you can, just for this time. Sometimes we're so busy in life that we segregate things. Um, but let you, let be curious. Be curious about um, the adversity perhaps you faced um, and ways that we can approach it maybe a little differently or find a new perspective. And then I would like to invite you, if you haven't already, to invite you to think of one practice that you can do for your own well-being. I think it's so easy for us to let that go and let that be the last thing. But it's so um, critical that we, if we don't take care of ourselves, um, that we have nothing to give to each other. So this is, if you like outlines like I do, um, I'm gonna move from naming adversity, how hard that is, to choosing perspectives to hold that adversity. The role of creativity in helping us get through adversity, ways to cultivate connection with ourselves and each other and God, and then some intentional practices that I've learned and shared in the healthcare setting, but I think can be relevant here as well. So first, naming adversity. I don't know about you, but it's easier for me to see other people's problems and want to help them, right? That's so much easier to do. Um, but my chaplain training slowed me down. It was like, no, um, <clears throat> you have to be aware of your own stuff inside because um, that can so easily get in the way. So chaplain training is all about um, thinking about why did I say what I did? Why didn't I just keep my mouth shut and let the other person speak? Um, because maybe if I had just held that silence a little bit longer, um, they would have said what they really needed to say instead of me feeling nervous and having to jump in. What I love about chaplaincy training is that the adversity that I saw in my patients and there was such great suffering and need wasn't mine to bear. I couldn't bear that, that's impossible. None of us can, um, but my job was to see 
I would say, see the Christ in them, see the inner wisdom. They knew their situation better than I did. So my job is just simply to be there to reflect back um, the wisdom that I saw in them and their holiness. And yeah, root them on. Like, this is hard, but you're going to survive. So when you're tempted to minimize, to say, oh, you know, my problems aren't as bad as my neighbor's, or so-and-so um, is so much worth off. You know, we have horrible things we can always compare ourselves to and then shut ourselves down and say, you know, I have no right to be worried because there's a war going on and I have food and shelter. So um, we can keep cutting ourselves off um, and shaming and blaming ourselves. Um, and that doesn't help anyone because um, ultimately it's your perspective that matters. Um, so Sean, thank you for this assignment because in the midst of the adversity of our last few years, I'll give you my quick list and you probably have your own. Um, I didn't have time to process. And so I had a lot of tears as I prepared this talk tonight, um, which was probably what I needed to do. Um, so I think all of us have to give ourselves permission um, to do that. When the dust finally settles and you have a quiet moment, let that quiet come. Um, and God will sit there with you. Others will be there to hold you um, because there's more to learn from that. So here was our litany, if you want to hear it. <laughs> it was, my stepfather died of dementia. My sister-in-law died, and we became a family of five with my nephew. Um, and then just as we started to get going and finding a rhythm, COVID hit. <laughs> so all three of my kids, which I'm sure you can relate to this, were at home. And so I can't thank my husband enough. I won't cry just yet because he had the harder job. We think being a chaplain in the middle of COVID in a hospital is hard. Try being at home with three kids and teaching them um, and keeping them engaged when they can't see their friends and we're all scared of COVID. So I told him I never would have lasted a month at home. <laughs> I was grateful I had that commute to VCU um, just to get out of the house. Um, but again, I shouldn't minimize my own uh, journey. We all have our own stories to share. Meet Langley. So Langley is four and a half pounds. Peach is now 50 pounds. She's our COVID puppy. Last Thursday, Langley showed up at our doorstep because our neighbor had to go out of town and didn't have his coverage, his usual Langley coverage. So in walks Langley into our house. And can you imagine? She it was shaking the whole time. Yipping, shaking, she jumped to the highest surface to see if she could escape Peach. Um, Peach was not going to hurt her, but she was just scared um, being you know, a tenth of her size. And so I use this as an image for um, what happens to our bodies in stress. So the stress reaction, you might've heard about it. It's fight, flight, or freeze. That's exactly what Langley did in our house. Um, but it's what my body did at the height of all this adversity. So every day I was in that mode and, I, you know, your blood pressure goes up and your heart rate goes up. And um, that's great. Our bodies are built for survival. So, you know, if I need to run, I can do that in a moment. If I'm running to a page, um, to a death, whatever it is, I can do that. But when you sustain that over a period of time, it does some serious damage. <laughs> so it's not good to stay in that state. Um, and so just watch your body, that's what I'm suggesting, um, that the wisdom of our bodies will tell you, even if you're saying, I'm fine. You're waking up at 2 a.m. and your mind is racing like mine was, or um, you may feel it in the pit of your stomach. You can't eat normally. Or um, for me, it's like in my shoulders. I start to get neck and shoulder pain. It wasn't a heart attack the heart palpitations. I hope you know, don't know anything about what I'm talking about. Um, but I have a sense that I'm not alone. So Langley, um, eventually after three days, was able to settle down a little bit. And I'll show you another picture in a minute. Um, but we have to find those places of safety um, for ourselves when we find ourselves in deep adversity. 
I wasn't helpful to myself either. So I share this because you may have the same tendencies as I do to do the negative um, self-talk or justification. So I would say things like, well, I have to see that one, that other patient. So yeah, I'm gonna be an hour later, maybe not miss dinner with my family, but I'm the only one that can do this. Um, it's better because of the continuity of care. I've known them for three days. Um, and Steve would say, you know, I'm concerned about you. And I'd be like, eh, um, I'll take a day off next week, I promise. And then next week would come and we'd be short staffed and I let myself get called in as the backup. So I'm really good at justifying things. I don't know if you are too, but just to uh, give you an opportunity to pause, take out that little piece of paper I gave you. And if, does anybody need another piece of paper? If you hadn't gotten one, just raise your hand. So what I'd like to invite now is for you to take a moment. This paper is for your eyes only. You don't have to share it with anybody. I just want to give you a space. This is what I used to do with my, my burnt out nurses and doctors that I worked with. Take a moment, and just be honest with yourself and write down a word or phrase of what adversity you might be facing. And just kind of get it out on the paper. Um, and then keep the paper flat, don't fold it yet. And then you can turn it over and we'll come back to it. So just take a moment now and let yourself be honest and, and write a few words down. If you don't wanna write a word, feel free to draw a picture. I know some people work better that way. I'll just give you one minute. So it's not easy to be vulnerable. I don't know if you can see this picture. This is our puppy, Peach, when we first got her. And she has her tail tucked in. Um, it was the first time our family met her. She was 14 weeks old. She was found abandoned on the side of the road. Um, and then there's Langley and Steve trying to comfort her from shaking. <laughs> and I think we closed Peach out for a moment um, just to calm her down. But after three days, um, I wanna say they practice vulnerability with each other. They, there's a trust factor they um, built. And so they could end up sleeping in one bed, not touching, but side by side to each other. I'd like to share a brief quote by David White, one of my um, husband's favorite poets. He talks about vulnerability. Vulnerability is not a weakness a passing into indisposition or something we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. Vulnerability is the underlying, ever-present, and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not and most especially to close up our understanding of the grief of others. More seriously, in refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence. And we immobilize the essential title and conversational foundations of our identity. So for white, vulnerability is a key part of who we are. Richard Rohr also says, 
um, something that I think is so true, which is what we don't transform, we transmit. Um, another saying I've heard, or saying I've heard is, hurt people hurt people. Sometimes not knowing it, the people that we love the most, if we don't take that time um, to transform the things that have hurt us, the adversities over the course of our life, um, when we invest in ourselves, we invest in the people that we love. And so I'm, I'm sad to say that those years that I was working so hard and so stressed out, I feel like I missed so much with our family because I was just so tired. My kids knew when I got home that mom had like maybe a half hour <laughs> in her and it wasn't much fun. And I just have to like go to bed and try to start all over again the next day. It, was, it took every ounce of my energy just to survive. And that wasn't a good state to be in. Um, and I can only see that now after leaving it. <laughs> um, so being vulnerable, while painful, is building the capacity to trust. And when we talk about this word adversity, I'd like to balance that with another word that I recently Vulnerability can bring us to this place of despair. Have you ever heard that word before? So it sounds a little like despair, but it's kind of the opposite. Um, again, I found this from Steve, so I'll give him credit. Um, it's an old English word that we don't use very often, but I think really can mean a whole lot to us now. Respair is a noun and a verb, and it means the return of hope after a long period of despair. Doesn't that speak to our, our current condition? And the verb is to hope again, so it's this active thing that we can do together. So I love this bringing into adversity, respair ability to hope. So what are perspectives? How do we hold adversity when we have to face it? As a chaplain, I realized for some people, they had paradigms from when they were kids um, that when they experienced something really hard, like a car accident or something debilitating, um, that paradigm no longer worked. So I think it's really important to reflect on um, the self-talk that we have. Um, so an image, uh, actually a word in Chinese, crisis. I learned that the word crisis is actually two words put together. Um, so opportunity and danger. So interesting that those two words that don't seem related are together for a crisis. So see if that fits for you. In the times that we feel most threatened, do we also have an opportunity? We watch Jesus of Nazareth every Lent together as a family. And so my son, Ben, um, is always amazed at how Jesus is able to transform a really um, serious argument. So he's like, I never want to argue with Jesus because he always wins. You know. So the, here's the coin. Who are you giving it to? Are you giving it to Caesar or to God? And he has this perfect way where they put him in a hole and he comes out above it. So he uses it as an opportunity to transform people around him. The sunflower. So as a novice gardener, the sunflower was a, a huge boost to my confidence. I put a sunflower seed when the kids were little into the ground in our townhouse forgot about it, didn't water it, days came by, all of a sudden it just shot up. It was a mammoth summer, sunflower, 12 feet into the air over our, um, our fence. And um, it was beautiful, this huge, beautiful sunflower. So the sunflower is supposedly a symbol of hope and joy um, of faithfulness. What I love about the sunflower is that it's heliotropic. So it faces the east and then it turns through the day. Um, and so I think of it as like in the midst of adversity, trying to look to Christ to help guide us. But how does this happen, right? How does the flower know how to follow the sun? That's kind of crazy. And what I found is fascinating. So it's able 
to face the sun because of the growth on the dark side. It's rapid growth on the dark side of sunflower that pushes it towards the light. And so I've used that in reflections because um, while it doesn't feel good to lean into the things that feel dark in our lives, it's precisely the growth in the dark place that pushes us towards the light. The Isaiah reading that was in today's prayer before this talk, that was the reading that we chose for our wedding. When I was 24, he was 26, and we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. <laughs> Again, making a promise to be together and love each other forever. What is that? Um, but I find such comfort in it. Um, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, I do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out of my mouth and will not return to me empty. There's something freeing about knowing that in the midst of adversity. It's not just up to me. It's not just up to you, um, but that we have, we are gods. Um, a professor in, at CTU where I went to grad school said, we have to remember whose we are in times of adversity. So I promised a story from my work at Hospice House. And this is a very special story to me. I met Art, um, probably now it's been 15 years. He was a World War II vet. He was gruff. Um, I'm not using his wife's real name. I'm saying her name is Sarah. And she had this thing called vascular dementia. So she couldn't verbalize anything, but she would mumble. She used to be a labor and delivery nurse. So she walked around with a little baby doll in her hand, and um, he was her caregiver 24 seven. He was bound to the house to watch her. He took such good care of her that she was kicked out of hospice. This happens. Um, and then she had to buy his own diapers and change her without any help. But as a hospice chaplain, hospice house chaplain, I could still go in and check on him. <clears throat> so I saw the progression of her disease one night she wandered out in her nightgown and crossed a very busy street. It took hours for the police officers to find her. And so he just added another lock that she couldn't reach on the door. Then she started falling. And so he got a motorized chair to get her to the second floor of the condo. No problem, I'll take care of that. Um, I'll put some padding on the uh, brick siding of the fireplace so she won't hurt herself like last time and get stitches. And even though he was tired, and I think he was lonely, um, he was the vision of love. He was exactly where he wanted to be. And there was nowhere else in the world that he would choose to be. So when she died, they'd been married 68 years, he felt lost. He said, Allison, I lost my job. I'm almost 90 years old. What am I going to do? So that's scary at any age, not just when you're close to 90. Um, there are many things that can uh, shake us, right? Job loss, death in the family, so many things. So I don't know what he thought of me. I was an early chaplain uh, in my early 30s. I wanted to save the world and I knew nothing of what it was like to be in his shoes, um, but he trusted me and he um, let me come into his room and told me awful jokes, which I laughed at. Um, what impressed me about Art was that he was willing to find a new normal. He could have just thrown in the hat and said, um, you know, I heard this thing about spouses die close to after their spouse dies, so I might as well just give up and die. But no, he, he was the most active member of my bereavement program. He was always game. Um, he came, even came to my meditation class. And I knew he was there because he was snoring and woke the rest of us up. But he found purpose and meaning in realizing that, hey, he still had more life to live. And not only that, um, six months in after his wife died, he realized he could offer 
a hospitality to the newly bereaved, which he couldn't before, because he knew, he knew what they were going through. And so that was, uh, for me, um, participating in the Holy Spirit in a very deep way. Because I, I couldn't control all these people that were meeting. I just gave them a space and a place to walk and something to eat. Um, but they celebrated with each other. We laughed so, so much. You wouldn't think of a grief group as being a place where you could laugh, but we sure did. And it was over like little things that others didn't appreciate. Like this one lady, she, um, her husband always pumped the gas. So either she lived in New Jersey or she just never, ever pumped gas. So she was terrified. It took all the strength in her to admit to the group. I just don't know if I can do this, but my car is running out of gas. I got it. So when she finally did, we were like applauding and so excited for her. Um, so there was a, a spirit of celebration and connection that happened. And so that's why I like grief groups. So creativity. We talked about naming, framing and diversity, being careful of the perspectives that we choose. Now I'm turning to creativity. When we listen with compassion and empathy, something new can emerge. Um, we can see something else that we didn't already see. So I have a little story. I hope you haven't already heard it. It's called The 18th Camel. Anybody heard it? All right. So it's a Middle Eastern story, and it goes like this. You're going to have to do a little math, but I won't test it. Okay, so many years ago, a man died and left his camels to three sons. One half to the oldest, one third to the second son, and one ninth to the youngest. So one half, one third, one ninth. However, there was a problem. He had only 17 camels. A dispute quickly arose among the brothers. The eldest son argued that the father's will was an error because one half, one third, and one ninth do not add up to one whole. He felt that he should receive all of the camels because this was the tradition in the community. The middle son said that his wife had the potential to be very ill and pleaded for an extra camel so he could sustain the family. Although the story was not true, it seemed like a good idea at the time to get that extra camel at all costs and deal with the family fallout later. The youngest son argued what was allocated to him was actually one-sixth because a number reversal had occurred. So the adversarial negotiation escalated. The feud became so heated that the families did not speak to each other. The brothers no longer allowed their children to play and they terminated all joint ventures between themselves. One of the siblings even thought of killing some of the camels or his brothers. The brothers des desperately needed something to resolve this conflict. So they finally agreed to go to a wise old woman in the community and tell her of their problem. They gave her the right to arbitrate and to dictate a solution. She said, I am old and I am unable to ride my camel, so why don't you take it? Then you will have 18 camels and you can divide it among the three of you. So help me out here if you want. The brothers gave half of 18 to the eldest, which is nine. And then for the second son, <clears throat> it was a third. So a third of 18 is six. And then the ninth um, of 18 for the third son, two. So nine plus six, 15 plus two is 17. So they had a camel left over after all of this. And the brothers were able to decide, meh, we'll return the camel back to the old woman. So what is the point of this story? That we can get stuck. We can get so entrenched in, I deserve this. I've given enough. This is not fair. We dig in and we get nowhere but they were smart enough to ask for help and smart enough to go to the wise old woman. And what did she give? She gave her generosity. Um, 
She diffused the situation. She de-escalated it all. So sometimes we need to look to each other to help us get unstuck in adversity. Are there times when you feel like the brothers? I know I do. Are there times when you are looked to to be the old woman? So one more story, but this time the other end of the life spectrum. So I'm sure you have your own pandemic stories to share. The one I want to share is from the neonatal intensive care unit. It was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So there were no vaccines and every day there was increasing visitor restrictions. And there was a family that the staff and I grew very fond of. Um, we're fond of all of our little babies, our little preemies, but this one um, held a special place in our heart because she was there so long, like seven months. For a long time, we didn't know what was wrong with her. Um, she would just stop breathing and being in the ICU, they could resuscitate her, but she couldn't go home. She had a trach um, in her neck. So she was the cutest baby, would smile, but you couldn't hear a sound because she had the little trach. But we loved her nonetheless, and we were her family. So um, I'm gonna call her Amy. And her parents were amazing. They had a 10 year old at home. And uh, so they kept switching every night. So neither child would be alone. And they did this for months. So, it was, and it wasn't a surprise that night when I got three texts from different nurses telling me Amy died. And it was devastating. Their primary nurses who were like second moms, um, they came in um, from their day off, wet hair wet from their shower, rushing in because they wanted to be able to see her one last time. Because once she was gone, we wouldn't be able to see them again. There would be no funeral. And we really um, were devastated by this. So the rule was that once you didn't have a patient in the hospital, you can't come into the hospital, right? Um, so here, this family who had become part of our family, uh, NICU family every day, um, would be left without a funeral. It would never see us. And this was just too much for anyone to bear. But what were we gonna do? So. We also didn't want to burden them with COVID on top of that. So we didn't want to get them sick. So we wanted to play by the rules that we knew at the time. And then um, we didn't want to get sick and then have another NICU baby. They have no immune systems. So um, we felt caught and trapped in our grief, but knowing we needed to do something. And so this is where the creativity comes in. So we just talked. And like, what are we gonna do? So the nurse manager, um, the primary nurses, myself, the social worker. I finally said, okay, we're just gonna make this up. We're gonna pick a day that's sunny and we're gonna do a drive-through memorial for her because we have to do this. So there were 45 nurses, a couple doctors, myself and the managers that came out. And they were in a small little tiny uh, townhouse with a small little yard in the front so the grandparents, the parents, um, and the, the little brother were all there. And so we're like, all right, we'll figure this out. So I gave each car, because um, nobody shared cars, right? There's these 45 cars lined up in this townhouse division. And all the neighbors are looking like, what in the world is going on? So everybody had an item that we were gonna use in a, a procession. So the doctor drove up first and she was her day off. So her three kids who are in virtual school are in her back seat. So she gets out of the car and she brings this huge stuffed animal to the brother. And then we all cry, you know, as we see them um, and waving at each other, but at least we got to see each other. Then the next person brought a vase, an empty vase. Um, and then the chaplain resident came and played the guitar and then the next car came along and put in one flower. Um, and then the next car and the next car. And then before you knew it, we had a bouquet um, of love sitting before them. And then I was like, okay, it's time to leave guys. We, we can't keep hanging out here. But 
they couldn't say goodbye just yet. So people double parked their cars, blocked people in, and then we stood on the sidewalk six feet apart. Um, and I facil facilitated um, the litany of remembrance over the family, which is saying that we will remember your child and you through all the seasons. And then they asked to say a blessing for us and to thank us for all our care. Um, so I will always remember that moment. And I think everybody there will as well. Um, but it, it pushed us um, to be creative, to make it up. Like nobody had done this before. Um, and we're looking at each other like, who's doing what? Doesn't matter, we're together. Um, So in the spirit of creativity, I invite you to take that little sheet of paper and it's okay to make a mistake. So don't be perfectionistic about this, um, that the words are for your eyes only. What I'd like you to do is along those words of adversity, write in God, write in a word for you that works, Holy Spirit, Jesus, put God alongside those things that are bringing you adversity. Invite him into that space. And then if you want to, um, fold the paper so that the, the words are on the inside. So just an ordinary square of paper. And I invite you to fold two triangles. So one this way, and then make a crease. And then open it up and then make a triangle in the opposite direction. So you got this. And if it doesn't turn out, no stress. Okay. Then take any corner and fold it to the middle. So it looks something like this. So you see like a little point pointing down, take the bottom tip and then fold it to the top middle. So it looks a little bit like an envelope. All right, now this is the tricky part. You can do this. So take, come on, Sean, um, bottom left corner, okay? up to the top middle, and you'll start to see half of a heart. So the bottom left corner up to the top middle, and then repeat on the other side. Bottom right corner up to the top middle. And you kind of see the heart forming, right? How we doing? And then you're pretty much done. You just want to fold in. Anybody need some help? It looks like that. And then just to soften the edges of the heart, however you want to do it, I just fold the tips down from the top to the back. I see people laughing. Hopefully you're having a good time. <laughs> Any way you want to fold it is good. Okay. So what I love about origami, even if it's frustrating, is that you take something so ordinary, a piece of paper. Where can you go and not find a square piece of paper? So I would do this on the NICU and make little butterflies or animals or hearts um, and leave them for my, the parents. Um, and so it's an opportunity to wordlessly um, offer a sign of care to somebody. <laughs> so thanks for trusting me to try this out. But maybe it can be a symbol for you, this Lent. So you originally wrote down the words of adversity. We allowed God to be alongside those and then wrapped it in love. So the last section that I want to talk about is connection. 
connection to ourselves and others. So what practices do you have right now that help you um, connect with your thoughts? For me, it's walking in nature. Um, for some, it might be meditation. But just be aware of the things that you do for yourself. Quiet down and connect. There's this thing called three good things. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a study out of Duke University. Um, Brian Sexton is the author. And what he found was that, no surprise, we remember all the bad things because um, that's what we do to survive. And so it's like Velcro. He says it's like Velcro. We can remember the one bad thing somebody said to us you know, two weeks ago, but we forget the 50 nice things that people um, appreciated about us. And that, we say that's like Teflon. So even though we talk about, yes, it's important to be grateful, it's important to be grateful, he actually did a study, this is interesting, found out that if you go 15 days, maybe you miss a couple of days, you do 15 days every day at bedtime before you go to bed when your mind is integrating, and you take a moment to think of three good things. Think of three good things, how you were part of that, what emotion it made you feel. And the results were astounding. It was it was stronger than an SSRI, an antidepressant, taking an antidepressant for a whole year. So I, if you never needed a reason to um, practice gratitude, maybe this study will help you want to do it more. If you like apps, you can sign up and it will give you a reminder at 7 p.m. Our family did it for 15 days and the boys even enjoyed it. Um, our son Ben said, you know, mom, I think I'm grateful that we're doing these gratefuls. Um, Cause it was just something that we, it just brought us joy to, to review our day and think about that. So I invite you for a moment to think of a gratitude. If you want to write it on your heart. And I'll read this quick poem from Mary Oliver about praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. almost done. So when we're full, when we've listened to ourselves, we can offer a listening ear to those who need us most. And that's the foundation of being a chaplain, right? Um, I love this quote by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, and it's about listening. The listening is the oldest and perhaps the most powerful tool of healing, and is often through the quality of our listening and not the wisdom of our words that we are able to affect the most profound changes in the people around us. When we listen, we offer with our attention an opportunity for wholeness. I have a very short clip, which I think you'll enjoy, about sympathy and empathy and how we can better accompany one another. So what is empathy? And
So basically the video was about sympathy versus empathy, that um, we can, oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Brene Brown, if you've heard of her, she's a, a psychologist that talks about vulnerability and, and the power of accompanying other people through, through our vulnerability. So in that connection of the things that I have, that have wounded me, I can connect with that pain in other people and offer um, empathy. So a hand on the shoulder, um, I think I've already said this, I'm just that quiet um, listening and not imposing our own judgment on that. Um, another person, if you want more books on um, interesting literature on spirituality and resilience and post-traumatic growth is Dr. Robert Wicks. So Riding the Dragon is one of his great books on um, perspective. Um, but he talks about connection. So um, the importance of having building resilience outside of the time of adversity. So um, four types of friends. So four types of friends, if you don't already have these types of folks in your life, are an important way to help balance us. The first one is the prophet. So the prophet is a person who challenges you, who may tell you things that you don't want to hear, but that you need to hear. So having a friend like that in your life is important. Two, the cheerleader. Somebody who cheers you on and is behind you all the way, no matter what you do. Um, the third one is the jokester, not to take yourself too seriously, um, to be able to laugh and hold yourself lightly through life. And finally, the inspirational friend who helps you to be all that you can be. So as we wind our time to a close, um, I just want to thank you um, for letting me be part of this Lenten journey with you. Um, we talked about naming, reframing, the role of creativity, um, tending to connection. And as we prepare to say goodbye, I leave you with a closing blessing. So I invite you to um, look at your palms, look at your hands. These unique hands um, are the only ones in the world with these particular wrinkles, these particular creases, lines, and scars. Um, they were formed in the womb by God. Reflect on all you have done with these hands. Cleaning, working, drying tears, cooking, driving, lifting, praying, holding and hugging. We give thanks for all that has been possible because of your hands. We acknowledge all of the invisible work that may go unacknowledged. May your hands help you, re help you release anything you need to let go of. May your hands help you receive the blessings awaiting you. And when your hands get weary, may you find God holding you through another's hand. And you, may you be the hands of God to another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few minutes if anyone has any questions or comments or anything you'd like to ask her to expand upon. Yes. Anyone else? Questions? Mark turned to me when we were folding our hearts and he said, isn't it fitting that yours is black? <laughs> like my soul. But anyway, um, <laughs> anything else? Okay, well, Allison will be around for a few minutes. Thank you very much for coming and being with us this evening. Uh, and thank you all as well. And tomorrow evening, we'll conclude our mission uh, with what is our Lenten, uh, what is our weekly though, 
uh, Stations of the Cross with a Soup Supper. Uh, so hope that you will uh, join us tomorrow evening as well. Uh, thank you once again for being here tonight. And thank you, Allison, once more for being with us too. So. Have a great evening.